Following on from its Focus sedan, Ford is now adding a station wagon to the Focus range. The car is an all-German effort, designed in Cologne and built in Zalui in southwest Germany. It's been given a thorough makeover to fit in with Ford's new corporate look. Carl Philip Moore from Ford says the company has incorporated many new driver aids and safety features into the new Focus. Ford is proud to be market leaders in that respect, and he says there's no other car in the class which can offer these features. One of those new features is a blind spot monitoring system. It detects when another vehicle is in the driver's blind spot and alerts the driver with an orange LED in the wing mirror. It's a big help during lane changes in busy traffic. All in all, the Focus is a very engaging car to drive, thanks to a perfect marriage between chassis and suspension. And it's an important car for Ford. Over half of Focus buyers will opt for the station wagon. Ford's Carl Philipmov says it's an important vehicle for the fleet sector. It's a market segment which has picked up pace in Germany, so Ford is optimistic. And he says it's also an attractive car for private customers. That's thanks to the Ford's practicality. The spacious trunk offers 476 litres of luggage space. And the seats fold flat, extending its carrying capacity to over 1,500 litres. But despite its practical design, Ford's engineers have also injected some style into the Focus. The large front grille gives the car a more youthful look than its previous incarnations. Inside, there's a rich mix of high-quality materials, but the wraparound dashboard and steering wheel look slightly cluttered with their different knobs and switches. Our test model was the 1.6-litre turbo diesel. It puts out 70 kilowatts and can cover 100 kilometres on just 4.2 litres of diesel. German buyers can pick up the new Ford Focus station wagon from 18,650 euros. The model we drove sells for 24,500 euros. To sum up, Ford's new Focus station wagon has something for everyone. It's always been practical and with its new styling, it's now more desirable than ever. Many consider Porsche the most iconic German sports car maker. For years, its cars have been the ones to beat out on the racetrack. But now there's a challenger in town. This is the BMW 1 Series M Coupe, and it's looking to steal the Porsche crown. But is it an unfair fight? Könnte man our test driver, Gerald Czajka, doesn't think so. The two cars both have six-cylinder engines and nearly identical performance. The BMW has the engine in the front, the Porsche has it in the back. But both are rear-wheel drive. He says the two models are great fun to drive. The Porsche Cayman R is a no-holds-barred sports car. Although it might not look it, the R is exactly the same size as the Cayman S. Our tester, Gerald, says the Cayman R is a thoroughbred sports car, from the sports seats right down to the sound of the engine. He says the flat six engine in the back really packs a punch and sounds incredible. He says it's great fun to drive but is very uncompromising, so if you drive over a drain cover you will really feel the jolt in your back. But he says out on the racetrack it's a superbly balanced car and you can really chew up the tarmac. That means 0 to 100 in 4.9 seconds and a top speed of 280 kmh. 
The BMW's 3.4 litre engine produces 370 newton metres of torque and 243 kilowatts. And there's the traditional Porsche engine note, but only in the upper rev range. There's power available in any gear. The steering is responsive and there's a fast shifting dual clutch transmission. All this helps the Cayman clock up record times on the track. Inside, it's stripped out. A stereo system and air conditioning do not come as standard, although they can be retrofitted as extras. In Germany, a Cayman R with dual clutch transmission sells at €72,977. BMW has taken a different approach with the 1 Series M Coupe. The driver is treated to luxurious sports seats and an Alcantara trimmed cabin. A steering wheel with red stitching completes the look. The cabin is not quite as exciting as in the Cayman R. But the 1 Series scores in other areas. With its bullish front, pumped up wheel arches and a wide rear end, it's not afraid to show off its M Division heritage. Our tester says the 1 Series is a really capable car. The cabin is perhaps a little too similar to a standard 1 Series, but the Alcantara and red stitching are nice touches. But the real star of the show is the engine. He says it has bags of power and is great fun to drive. The twin turbocharged 3 litre straight six engine is a real powerhouse and pulls hard throughout the rev range. BMW claims 250 kilowatts, seven more than the Cayman R, but the Porsche also can't match the BMW's 450 newton metres of torque. It needs just 4.9 seconds to top 100 kmh, but is limited to a top speed of 250 kilometres an hour. The Series 1 M Coupe is 250 kilograms heavier than the Cayman R. In Germany, it can be all yours for 50,500 euros. Our tester says the Series 1 is less of a sports car. It's as if BMW thought most of its potential customers would be rich and prefer luxury over an uncompromising sports car. That means automatic climate control and comfortable seats. Porsche left those things out on purpose. And that's what makes the difference. The M Coupe finishes slightly ahead of the Cayman R because it's a full 22,500 euros cheaper and is more luxurious and practical. But out on the racetrack, the Cayman R still rules the roost. With the Ampera, Opel has brought out its first electric hybrid series for the mass market. The Ampera has an all-electric range of 60 to 80 kilometers, which the 1.4-litre gasoline engine extends to 500 kilometers. The suggested retail price in Germany is just under 42,000 euros. The Ampera goes on sale in Europe at the end of the year. Mazda is marketing new, efficient technology for its next generation of cars under the umbrella name of Skyactiv. Engines, transmissions, chassis and car bodies are designed to reduce fuel use and CO2 emissions. Mazda says the innovations will deliver 30% better fuel economy by 2015, thanks to lightweight construction. In 2012, the CX-5 SUV will be the first model with the new technology to go on sale in Europe. Seat is taking its Alhambra family van into new terrain. Starting now, the 2.0-litre TDI is available as a full-time four-wheel drive. That provides better traction and more stable handling even under tough road conditions. Of course, that doesn't turn the people carrier into a classic all-terrain vehicle, but the four-wheel drive is certainly a major enhancement.
As Thomas Dicker of SEAT points out, all-wheel drive satisfies customers' wishes for safety in all driving conditions. The system gauges the situation thanks to various sensors built into the car. There's ABS, ESP and sensors that tell if there's an incline or a start-up or braking situation. The torque from the engine is distributed flexibly between the front and rear wheels, although in everyday situations power is mainly delivered to the front wheels. The design gives the Alhambra TDI 4WD a consumption of 6 litres of diesel per 100 kilometres. Thomas Dicker says SEAT has always geared the Alhambra to young, dynamic families, and the new development is aimed at customers with sporty tastes, who like to drive in the mountains, who like to travel by car. For him, dynamic is the key word. The all-wheel drive is available in the reference and style versions, along with plenty of practical features. The opposing sliding doors make getting in easy. Technically, the new Alhambra is also at a high level. Purchasers can opt for bi-xenon headlights with curved lighting and high beam assist, along with a multifunctional camera with a lane departure warning system and road sign recognition. Parking assistant is another new feature. The interior has a modern, uncluttered feel. The Alhambra comes equipped with optionally five or seven seats. The back has a flat loading area where, with the new Easy Fold system, the seats in the second and third row can be raised with a flick of the wrist. In Germany, the four-wheel drive version comes with a price tag of over €32,000, around €1,000 more than the front-wheel model. It's the calm before the storm. The Red Bull hair scramble is being held in Eisenhout in Austria for the 17th time. The Outsberg is Europe's biggest enduro bike racing event. More than 1,800 competitors from 37 nations are taking part. And they're not alone. Some 35,000 enduro sports fans brave the weather to watch the event in Outsberg. This year, there's a star-studded cast, including Romaniacs winner Chris Birch and four-time hair scramble champion Taddy Blasuziak. He's the same man who showed up to watch in 2007, joined in, won the race, and also the next three. A qualifying event is held ahead of the main race. Of the 1,800 competitors registered to take part, only 500 will actually cross the starting line. A woman is also racing. <laughs> Christina Wiesner says she's going to approach the race calmly and in focus. And if it doesn't work out, she'll go back down and try again until the time's up. And they're off. The competitors start from a grid that's been set out according to their qualifying times. Taddy Blazusiak shoots right to the front, with Graham Jarvis hot on his heels. There are 20 checkpoints the riders must pass along the 35-kilometre course. They have four hours to complete the route. The going soon gets tough and the riders are taken through overgrown forests and up steep stream beds. Falls are all part of the game. Helpers are posted at some of the really tough spots in order to help the competitors along. Even the favourites end up in the dust sometimes. Outsberg has been used for enduro racing since 1995. Kyle Katoch had the idea of using the scenic site as a place to race. Only a few hundred riders took part in the first hair scramble, but as time passed, the event helped enduro racing become better known in Austria. This course is one where only a select few cross the finishing line. The thing with Erzberg is just it's the ultimate challenge. It's so extreme, it's so tough. It's, uh, you kind of feel like you're cheating yourself if you don't come back. Every year there's something to improve on, something to get better. And yeah, just the whole atmosphere, so many riders, so many spectators, it's quite addictive. Despite a fall, Blasuziak finishes, but in second place. He's happy he made it, but disappointed too. And then suddenly, Graham Jarvis's name is removed from the top of the list. 
Organizer Karl Katoch says the rules state every rider has to pass every checkpoint. He says they have a scanner to check, and he just heard Jarvis missed a checkpoint. And now that he's been up there, it looks like Tadi Blatuziak did pass that checkpoint, as did all the other riders after him. But Katoch says Graham Jarvis went by 15 meters below the designated spot, meaning he saved about 15 minutes on his time. That's too much, so they're disqualifying him. He's out of the race. The rules are the rules. So, Tadi Blasuziak's won the race again. He's over the moon. Yeah, well, actually, uh, you know, uh, Graham, he missed the checkpoint and uh, it came up that I won, so uh, fifth in a row. That's great. Well, you know, every win is, is so special, you know. It's so great to win again and... Uh, you know, it's uh, bad luck for Graham, you know, sorry for that, but that's, that's how it works and this is racing and I'm happy for a fifth win for sure. So Taddy is back on the winner's podium and it's an honest win. It's hard to believe but the Mercedes C111 is 40 years old. Back in 1969, the two-seater charmed the world when it was introduced with a fiberglass body and gull-wing doors. Its mid-mounted Wankel engine and brutish wide tyres were so un-Mercedes that car fans were slightly shocked. Some said the tyres would be too stiff a sports car. So the designers were given a free hand and they did what they thought was right. Many were already saying the car would be a worthy heir to the legendary wing-doored 300 SL. Mercedes inaugurated the C111 project at the end of 1968. The first version had a 300 horsepower three-rotor Wankel engine. Later models were built with a four-rotor Wankel unit capable of delivering up to 350 horsepower. Then modifications were introduced, like a variable intake system, for example, that increased torque up to some 540 Newton meters within a range of 2.5 to 5,000 RPM. Until then, that kind of performance was seen only in diesels. Further development and tests were pursued at speed, but kept top secret. The car was also a rolling laboratory for testing one of the world's first anti-lock braking systems. The test engineers were rotated between work in Hockenheim and Stuttgart unter Turkheim. The Mercedes motto, only the best is good enough, applied to the development of the C111, which is speeding towards series production. Everyone working on the car had to give it their all, partly due to extreme time pressure. Some engineers worked 36-hour shifts in order to keep to the schedule set by the head of development, Rudolf Uhlenhaut. The first test cars had about as much style as soapbox racers, but the designers weren't quite finished with their work. When they finally finished, the reviews of the unusual-looking C111 were full of praise. Computers were to help the car speed from the drawing board to the street. At the end of the 60s and start of the 70s, the enormous machines still ran on key punch cards and huge spools of magnetic tape. Back then, the designers were called stylists and worked with pencils and plasticine clay. But in the end, a global event prevented the C111 from going into series production. 
The oil crisis in 1973 brought the project to a halt as the demand for economical engines shot up. The Wankel wasn't suited for savings, so Mercedes made the C111 into a record breaker. Daimler-Benz fitted it out with a diesel engine to prove that the engines could do more than power trucks. So the C111 was back on the road as a turbo diesel. On the oval track in Nardo in southern Italy in 1976, C111 smashed all the world's speed records for three-litre diesel engines. The car reached speeds of up to 250 kmh thanks to improved aerodynamics and 230 horsepower rather than 190 under the hood. The version 3 silver C111 actually hit 320 kmh and later a V8 by turbo version actually topped 400 kmh. But though the car might have had plenty of buyers, the C111 never did make it onto showroom floors.